hard to see this podium. I want to take a moment to welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm much more comfortable behind the scenes than I am in front of them, so I will probably be reading an awful lot, which is totally fine. Um, I want to send a huge thank you to uh, everyone, to the Fox, making sure that we can enjoy this celebration. On behalf of the boy, the wife, and the girl, aka Eric, Wendy, and Emily, they send their gratitude and appreciation for all the well wishes they've already received and are very thankful for all of you here tonight. I've known Neil for about half of my life, and I'm so thankful to call him my friend. Um, and I will skip around a little bit, because I did practice, but apparently not enough. <laughs> it's a little overwhelming, so if you see the family members, please share a smile, a story, say hello, but also allow a little space in case they need it. The other people we'd like to mention as a special thank you would be our brothers and sisters working behind the scenes, Daryl Hilton, Rodney Amos, Al Herman, Charlie Taylor, Kaz Walding, Kelsey Bailey, and Mary Grove, along with our seat and feed family members, Karen Parker, Julie Sammons, Patricia Pitardo, San Torres, Sharon Bronstein, for all the hard work they did in putting this together in such a short time. Please be mindful. We are borrowing somebody's house. We're going to have to go camping and leave no trace. There are grab and go snacks and drinks over by the door. If you help yourself, please make certain you take your, everything with you or drop them in the receptacles on the way out. This is a celebration, so I really want you guys to enjoy and embrace the gregarious nature of Neil. If there are tears in your eyes, we're really hoping that they are happy ones. And we will enjoy sharing, sharing well-told stories with old and new friends. We hope to laugh and reflect. So I was brought here to Atlanta by the Olympics. I came with a friend of mine, Nicole. We were hired through ACOG, who treated us pretty poorly and paid us a lot worse. <laughs> right. On one particularly bad day for Nicole, Neil came up and he wrapped his gargantuan arm around her and he said, as he's leading her toward the stage where his hands were working, work with us, we'll treat you better and pay you more. Come, work with us, we'll treat you better and pay you more. Needless to say, at the end of that summer, we joined 927 and Neil pretty much became a staple in my life. He's the first friend that I had in Atlanta, and he brought me back here, not once, but twice. And for any of riggers that are here in the house, anybody, please join in, say hello. Woo! All right, so uh, I'm sure that many of you have at least heard of, if not seen, his master's thesis in rigging. That was him. As soon as he heard that I took a class at Columbus McKinnon, he was like, hey, you wanna see this? It's pretty cool. That was him looking out for anyone putting forth an effort to make their lives better. He would problem solve through any areas of your weakness to help you better yourself all the way around. He never batted an eye at anyone's abilities, male, female, it didn't matter. He would ensure that you were equipped to do the job and give you an opportunity to work it. Mentor, teacher, father, friend, brother, musician, he was a multifaceted man. On many occasions, he tried to get me to join the band. It didn't really matter whether or not I actually played an instrument. He said it didn't matter. For those of you who have never actually seen them, you're in for a real treat tonight. And I would say they're the ones in costume, but actually I don't think you guys would be able to tell the difference. <laughs> Seed and feed marching abominables fit his larger-than-life character and spirit, even if no one could come close to his stature. He proudly wore costumes that befitted a cowboy or a five-year-old ballerina, but that was just when he was one of the stores. So, you know, just hang on, keep your eye on the screen, and you'll see some of those later on. He kept me on my toes, often proclaiming something I thought was absurd, only to find out later that he was actually serious. For example, when he told me he was getting married, he didn't actually invite me to the wedding. He said, the band is going to go play out of town, and uh, I'm going to get married. And, and the conversation continued. No, 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 no. You're not actually getting married, like married, married. He said, yeah, I'm going to get married. Uh, oh, okay, great. I'll see you when you get back. And he left. And when he came back, he kept talking about this wife. And I said, but it's not a real wife. Like, this was a stick with the band, right? No. It was a real wife. <laughs> Listen, you can't possibly have gotten married in the ring. Uh, like, on the fly, like, in front of the officiant, that's, that's, you're married? Really married? Yeah. Like, until death do our, us part, Mary? Yeah, well, until Thursdays. What? What do you mean until Thursdays? 
until Thursday. I said it in my vows, so it must be. Uh, I don't think that's how it works. And, and then I met Wendy, and I thought, God, he could not have picked a better wife. It's hard to sum up 25, experience, 25 years of experiences. Just like many of you, he was always there for me. Need to move some furniture? He's there. Make a desk out of a hell poor door? He's got your back. So a tutu? Yeah, he'll do that too. If you just needed a little support, like when my house was broken into, he left his family and came over and sat with me, just so I wouldn't be alone. He also helped me raise my daughter. Now I know that I'm not the only one with a child who benefited from, a, from having him in their presence. And I would like to share a precious memory from Kelly and Dale, and unless they'd like to come up, just scream out if you do. All right. So here we go. I'm going to read it straight as it was sent to me. There were several families that had kids the same age range as Eric and Emily. And as is often the case, they grew up with each other in the band village. Kelly and Dale share this exceptional story of Neil's village parenting. Neil and family were with us, the Hardy Hawkins family, and probably the Salmon Spouse family at the Candler Park Fall Festival. We were near the children's area, and Neil was being playfully attacked by Logan, Ian, and at least two other kids, maybe Wesley and Eric. They were all under age seven. Neil had a kid hanging off in each limb with no noticeable impact on him. When a mother we did not know approached us, trying to figure out where to buy tickets so that her kids could attack the strong man. <laughs> Clearly they missed out on a great business opportunity. But the interaction shows that a random stranger could not only see his obvious strength, but his playful and gentle spirit that we all knew and loved. We would welcome anyone who would like to share a story. You can make your way up to the stage. Please be, be <laughs> noticing Gypsy. She's got the pom-poms over there, and we'll help you come up to the stage. If you don't want to come all the way up here, feel a little intimidated, that's fine. I'll bring the mic over to you wherever you are. Just let, you got to let Gypsy know. There are some rules to follow, though. First of all, we would like you to keep it a little brief. I know I'm a little long-winded at times. I'm sorry. Sarcasm, wry wit, and expansive vocabulary terms, highly recommended, not necessary. Also, if you've never used sarcasm before, please don't try here. It might be a little dangerous. A good story contains three items, a beginning, a middle, and an end. We really hope you use all three of those so that we can laugh with you and enjoy your memory. If you'd like to use a lectern, oh, it's great. Put those up here, hide behind it. If not, you don't have to. And if you want me to stay with you, I will. I'll be here to help you on and off for anything that you need. So I'd like to bring up Sharon to be our first guest to share her story on how he joined the band. Hi, I'm Sharon Bronstein, and I have the distinction of having brought Neil to band. So, we had both gone to the same grad school, and he was behind, a few years behind me, and so when he was moving to Atlanta, he talked to the chairman of our department, who said, when you're going to Atlanta, call Sharon, because she'll hook you up with some work. And, and so I did that, but we're on the phone, and we're gabbing, and we're catching up and figuring out who we are, and Neil says, you know, something, and I said, well, I gotta go, because I gotta get ready for a gig tomorrow. And he says, what kind of gig? And I said, the Juggler's Festival. So Neil says, oh, I'm going. So my response to that is, that's cool. I'll be the one in the pink tutu with the saxophone. And without missing a beat, he says, and I'll be the one in the blue tutu with the trombone. <laughs> <laughs> so Neil showed up the following Tuesday for practice. And that was the last time he left. He was always in the band after that. So. You know, it's a nice, it's a nice badge for me to wear. So, it's uh, an honor to be here speaking on behalf of this man that I love. So, all right. So now I'm going to bring out Charles Bohannon. Um, I'm Charles Bohannon. I uh, have been in the trombone section with Neil and Wendy and Eric for a long time. And um, I was asked to tell a story that probably about 80 people in the scene team could tell, um, but we wanted to make sure it got told. And that was the time that um, I and a 
about 80 of my closest friends for the first time ever experienced a surprise wedding. The um, costume hall that day was black and white with a touch of red. And so when Wendy appeared in the parking lot of the Days Inn where we were staying in Charleston, South Carolina, in a pure white wedding gown, nobody batted an eye. Nobody said, oh, looks like Wendy's getting married. No, no. Wendy is adhering to the costume thing. And shortly after that, Neil appears in a tux. We still didn't get it. The synapses weren't really firing that day. We just thought, well, there they are, and they're white and white. I think Neil may have had a red carnation on for the touch of red. But we, uh, as we, it was a very hot day, as it usually is the Sunday before Memorial Day. For those of you not in the band, we always go to Charleston every Memorial Day weekend, at least up until the last couple of years. And um, we play on the steps of the Customs House for a Sunday concert. And we gathered, we played our concert, and at one point we played Tailgate Grandma, which is a number that has a trombone feature. So the trombone section was asked to step forward, and we played the song, and we took our bow. And John O'Neill, who was our conductor at the time, he was the only one in on the secret. And uh, he turned to us and said, okay, you guys can go back, except Neil and Whitney, you stay. The next thing we knew, there were family members coming out of the crowd, and there was a minister who, someone said she was dressed in red, and I remember in that way. Anyway, all of a sudden, we were having a event, and it was the biggest surprise that any of us had ever uh, any of us had ever encountered. And uh, it was a great day. Uh, after the ceremony, we went back to our motel for uh, a reception. But what I wanted to, to say uh, is that, you know, the fact that, that, that we didn't know this was happening despite all the clues. And the biggest clue that we missed, you know, never mind Wendy's dress or Neil's tux, but Neil was not barefoot. <laughs> he did not have his cowboy boots on. He was wearing regular dress shoes. That should have told us all we needed to know. The last thing I'm going to say is, I don't know if this is a fact, but I'm going to hope that it is. I believe that it is. I'm pretty sure that there's never been a wedding where the bride and groom both played trombone during their wedding. I think that's a well record. <laughs>
And there were some words, I believe, were exchanged, but we didn't care because it was amazing. So that's all. Thank you so much. We have Shell who'd like to also share a story. And again, if you do not want to make the way up to this stage, it seems a little intimidating, feel free to let me know. I'll come to you. So here you go, Shell. Can't do that. Hi. Um, I had the honor of um, working with Emily and being with Wendy and everything. They're so amazing. I love them so much. Um, I, um, meeting Neil was such an experience, always the barefooted king and Contessa that would show up everywhere. And um, I have a small theater and he was helping us. And one day he um, said, okay, well, how can I help you? And we were getting ready to break down the show. And I said, well, we really need help loading the truck. So Neil was like, oh, I'll help. I, just, I totally can help load the truck. We had the truck halfway loaded and we were ready to like just get the rest of it in. But before we could get going, Neil had to take every single thing out of the truck, put it down on the ground, get everybody involved in how they were going to do it, and then, can you tell your oh, story? we're going to tell it in the light so everyone can see it beautifully. <laughs> oh, sorry. I like being in the dark. I'm, I'm usually backstage. I'm never, I'm not really on stage. Um, so he loaded the truck back up, and we got everything, you know, ready to go. We were driving away, and and the person that was with me was like. They're like, why did you do that? And I was like, listen, whatever Neil wants to do, you just let him do it because he's not going to let you tell him he can't do it. <laughs> so anytime I have ever needed anything, um, I could call him lights. He showed up at my theater with like a million lights, and, and he's just always been such a helper to the community. And um, I love you guys, and Whitney and Emily, you guys are amazing. And, um, Neil was just such an inspiration to me, so that's all. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Justin Schwartz. I'm a member of IOTC 927. Um, I'm going to share a prepared statement and then some of my own words about Neil. Um, Desiderata. Go placidly amid the noise and the haste, and remember what peace there may be in silence. As far as possible, without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. Speak your truth quietly and clearly, and listen to others, even to the dull and the ignorant. They too have their story. Avoid loud and aggressive persons. They are vexatious to the spirit. If you compare yourself with others, you may become vain or bitter. For always, there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interested in your own career, however humble. It is a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs, for the world is full of trickery. But let this not blind you to what virtue there is. Many persons strive for high ideals, and everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself. Especially do not feign affection. Neither be cynical about love, for in the face of all aridity and disenchantment, it is as perennial as the grass. Take kindly the counsel of the years, gracefully surrendering the things of youth. Nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden misfortune. But do not distress yourself with dark imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive him or her to be. And whatever your labors and aspirations, in the noisy confusion of life, keep peace in your soul. With all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams, it is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful, strive to be happy. Uh, I moved to Atlanta about five years ago after working with a different local in North Carolina for two years. And my first memory of Neil was on a job. Uh, he was in working with us, Hawaiian shirt, shorts and all. 
And I like to say that my old local taught me the work. 927 and Neil in particular taught me to be part of the union. Neil was a friend, he was a mentor, and he pushed me incredibly hard, but I'm better for it. And moving forward, the lessons that he taught me are things that I'm going to continue to try to apply. Um, I miss you, buddy. District 7 Communications Director of the IATSE. I serve seven states and <coughs> help make sure emails get out and social media gets managed and help out with all the political stuff. Um, Neil was the kind of guy that would never let anyone who was wrong in a room <coughs> not know that they were wrong. <laughs> Just the kind of guy he was. And I think that honestly, you know, the first time that he really picked on me and he got my goat, his eyes lit up like a Christmas tree. Um, we argued a lot as like big brother, little sister, and it was a lot of fun, and it was family, and it was wonderful. <clears throat> we went to a lot of functions together. We traveled to the general executive board meetings. We went to the district convention. We went to educational sessions for the union. He was a true believer, and he always wanted to push me to do better and push me to use my strengths, which in my case, I'm a social broker. I do networking, so hence communications director, and he made that happen for me. One of these meetings we went to, he and I had just been talking a couple of days before about this ridiculous old commercial that used to come on. <clears throat> a lot of you probably remember the jingle. Look for the union label when you are buying your shirt, dress, or blouse. And we both knew all the words, because it was just that catchy. And this meeting that we went to, they were talking about organizing and discussing how hard it was to get people really interested in the union. The person chairing that meeting goes, well, I don't think anybody's ever really come up with a good union jingle before. <laughs> and we knew it was our time. <laughs> and we looked at each other looked at the front of the room, and we both jumped up immediately. And we started the line, look for the union label. And slowly, other people in the room all started standing up and singing along with us. And by the end of it, we had probably at least 50 people standing up singing this stupid ILG song. It was phenomenal. And the chair of the meeting stops and moves slowly to the microphone and says, <clears throat> I stand corrected. <laughs> Neil was a force of nature, like none other. I first met him in the Crew One organizing, where he helped to organize all of the amphitheaters in Atlanta and teach the stagehands that they deserve better. He would take young workers under his wing, show them their strengths, and then show them how they could use them. And he always found ways to uplift people, even if he was sometimes a pest, which was most of the time. <laughs> but he always found ways to uplift us and to make sure that we were always okay. In times when I faced some of the hardest things in my life and I felt like I couldn't make it, he would lean against his desk, sigh deeply, and said, I don't know how to deal with this. And then he'd plonk that big bear mitt of a hand on top of my head and rest his arm on it and go, you don't get to do that. Oh, okay. All right. And the thought never really crossed my mind again. He was a wonderful human being. And yeah, we always butted heads. Of course we did. He was the worst best friend I ever had. He was my big brother. In, in every way, shape, and form. And the world is better for it had him in it. Hi, 
Hi, everybody. I'm Julie Sammons. I'm with the CPP Marching of the Roman Bowl, or the Eighth Army, if you like to call it. And I met Neil through the band, but um, I wanted to talk about some other things because Neil was the kind of guy, and I'm sure everybody here knows this, but he was the kind of guy that, so he knew me through the band, but my husband and I, Drew Stouse is my husband, and my husband and I always do sort of a lot of organizing and rabble rousing for fun stuff. And after I met him, and I can't remember, I don't think Sharon said, I don't remember the year, it was probably the late 80s, early 90s, I imagine, certainly before the pack of kids that, um, that mine was also in started running around. But, but Neil, the, 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 the crazy thing about Neil was if you said you were doing something fun, especially back then, he would be like, okay, and he would show up. So Drew and I shoot fireworks, and we shot fireworks all over town then with um, Sarah Poxtas, who's came in from D.C., and some other friends have been special guest stars on the fireworks for over the years, that we shot for the city of Decatur for years. We still run that show. And, um, and Neil would be like, okay, I'll do it. And then he would show up, and he would do at least half of the lifting and hauling and anything else he needed. And if we were going camping, he would say, okay, I'll do it. And then, you know, he would show up and help with whatever needed help. If you were going canoeing or tubing or any kind of paddling, he would be like, okay, when are you going? And he would show up and be helpful. And um, there was this one trip, some of you over there will remember, a few of you. I know, I know Catherine's here, so she's going to remember this. I think Sarah was there. Um, but it was a tubing trip. I think that I was in a kayak that day because I think I was secretly pregnant. So that would have been 94, I guess. Uh, no, 98, right, oops. Um, anyway, so I'm, a, I'm in a kayak, and Drew's in a kayak, but almost everybody else are in tubes. And we're going down the Cartagena River. And if you out there know the Cartagena River, it's a beautiful float. There's like a long float, and then there's an S turn, and then a bit more of a float, and then there's a waterfall. And this waterfall, I've seen five-year-olds go down with no flotation at all. I've seen kids, you know, of all ages go down with tubes, people do it in kayaks. It's, it's a really fun waterfall. Unfortunately, on that day, some of the maybe 30 people who decided crazily to go with us that day, some people had a little too much fun. <laughs> and one of our friends, Tom remarked later that he went on the trip with his 30 best friends and left with two uh, <laughs> because of the happiness that had ensued. But anyway, there were some people who really shouldn't have been out on the river. And although Drew and I don't invite on the river, and of course Neil didn't, we were in the back of kayaks. And so as the group approached the waterfall, um, and we were like, let's pull out, let's look at it, here's the way to go. People were kind of nervous. Neil went over first. Some people went over and immediately left because they were done with the day. But Neil stood there. He, he went across the falls, he stood up at the end, and then as the scared people, like my baby sister Kiki, as the scared people came down the falls, he literally you could think of it as Mama Cat, or you could think of it as Neptune coming up out of the water. He just reached down, grabbed whoever it was, and threw him to shore. <laughs> so there was a string of, I don't know, at that point, 25 people, and he just stood there at the, planted himself at the edge of the waterfall, and just grabbed them up and threw them to shore one by one. And that, to me, sort of epitomizes the meal that I always knew, that you don't have to tell him to go plant himself. You might not even really want him to grab you uh, <laughs> if you're in a or something. But he's going to be there, and if you need grab and you need thrown to shore, he'll do it. So that was, the, that was the story I wanted to share. I had actually one more floating story, though, that 
just cracked me up so much this past year, I mean this past week when I was thinking about it, which is another time that Drew and I had gone out just to play around with some kayaks that people had abandoned at my house, and they were like old, long, skinny, fiberglass kayaks, and Neil got in one, and it sank as we scooted him out from the shore, and the water rose, so if this is the top of the kayak, the water's like here. And I'm like, Neil, let me get you out of there. Let's get you out. And he's like, no, I'm fine. <laughs> and Alex continues to paddle around the lake for a while while I stood on the shore and laughed at him. But that's also another part that Neil, you are all familiar with, I'm sure, that you know, there was fun to be had, he was going to have it, and nobody was going to stop him, but he was going to be really stubborn about the way he was going to do it. So we loved him. We loved having adventures with him. And... Um, you know, Guacamole's out there. Anything we can do for you, we're there. Let us know. Hello, uh, I'm Emily Guacamole. You may know me as the girl. <laughs> Uh, I knew my father for 16 years. A lot of people in this room definitely knew him for longer, but, you know, I still think that I spent a lot of good time to, with him, so I've come to tell you a story today. And, um, in the terms of stories, I could go anywhere. There's, a there's, a when he had to come into a locked building because I was too scared to help him get back in, or, uh, when, when I was a baby and my family accidentally left me in a burning building, um, but... <laughs> Today, I've come to tell you one of my favorite stories about him. Uh, so this was about like February 2017-ish. Uh, we were going to Disney for a trip. Uh, I think my brother was in the uh, DHS marching band, which is in our high school, and they were going to uh, Disney for, for their trip that year. Uh, so it was like nearing the tail end of the trip. Eric had already split off to go in be with the band people because they had come out, come down already. Uh, so we were gonna, we were trying to go to somewhere to see the fireworks. Um, it was like this pier somewhere, like one of the Disney, like on the Disney, Disney property. But uh, so we were going out to do this. Uh, and we had parked and we were going across uh, the inlet to the parking lot so that we could go to where we needed to be. So my father and I, we both look both ways, but if you knew my father, you knew that he was a rampant Jane Walker. <laughs> Just like something he did, like for fun, I guess. But I would normally follow him, so he and I both like ran out into the crosswalk to cross the street. Um, at that time, a car pulled in and like pulled into the crosswalk, and it was like going slow. It wasn't a car that was going very fast. Anyways, uh, <laughs> hit my father. Um, he flew into me, I ended up on the ground, we both ended up on the ground, uh, I seem to remember blacking out for a little bit, uh, came to, got up, he also got up at the time, my mother was worried about both of us, obviously, but, uh, you know, we both felt fine, like, I was skipping around, having fun, he was up and walking, uh, the girl gets out of the car, she's like, oh my god, I'm so sorry, and she's all, like, gussied up, because she's got a date, um, but, you know, he ends up, we, we end up, like, uh, taking an ambulance to the hospital, whatever. He was, like, 100% lucid, as was I, uh, we had to wait a little bit to, uh, to get a room, but once we did, we just kind of sat there for a while. They had Animal Planet on, on the television, so we just watched, like, the one about the guys making fish tanks. I don't remember the name of the show. Like, that's not, that's not useful information for me, but, like, yeah, that's where, that's where we ended up, you know. <laughs> they wanted to give us both some x-rays. They wanted to give my father x-rays because he was the one that actually got hit by the car. Uh, I wanted x-rays too because at the time, you know, my nose was hurting a little bit. <laughs> so they x-ray my father. Uh, all I can find is like a fracture in his wrist. They x-ray me and they find a fracture in my nose. Uh, to this day, my running theory <laughs> is that when he got hit and when he flew into me, it was his wrist that hit my nose. <laughs> so I, I've always gone like for the for the we both destroyed each other, but other than that, no injuries. That's that's so 
you know, that just goes to show, he's a, he was a hardy man, he raised hardy kids, that's all I've got. <laughs> I realized a couple of years ago that Memorial Day had become my favorite holiday. It was absolutely where my family got together and I enjoyed the time together. Um, we've already heard about the raising kids together. One thing that happened about 10 years ago was my son George playing the tuba forgot his mouthpiece to a gig. So not only did uh, Neil rouse him that day about having to walk with a tuba, but every single time thereafter, he said, hey, George, you got your mouthpiece? Um, our kids were on opposing teams, so when Eric was playing on ulti one ultimate frisbee team with George and on the other, he yelled across the field, hey, George, you got your mouthpiece? <laughs> Swim meets. You know, it just happened over and over again. A couple of weeks ago, I forgot what happened, <coughs> and I called. <laughs> hey, Wendy, you're going to remember this. Um, I really... And uh, my son George, I asked him if he had a special memory. And he said, I remember being in uh, Charleston one time, and they were very, very little. And Neil kind of waddled up one of the front Fredrickstone walk. And George said he was kind of bored. You know, he was pretty young at that time. And Eric, uh, George, Neil brought Eric. He said, here, here's Eric. Have fun. Play together. <laughs> That's the kind of guy he always was. He was looking out for other people. So, really, really miss you, Neil. All right, do we have anybody else that would like to say any words? want to make sure that everybody has had a chance because I love hearing these stories. All right, we're good. So I'm going to share one last one because I am a little long-winded and Neil knew that and that was fine by him. But when the break was over, he really wanted to make certain the break was over. And so he'd take his giant paws and he would stick them on either side of my arms, squish me together and walk me across the stage to where I needed to be. All the while saying, break is over, done talking. You work now. Break is over. Done talking. You work now. I really miss that. And although I do not have Neil's giant paws carrying me across the stage, we do have the seed and feed marching abominables to take us out in the most beautiful and most best way of a tribute possible. Please welcome them to the stage. Oh, wait. We have one more person. Hold on. Thank y'all very much. My name is Star Wright. I'm with IHCA 24 out of Athens and 927 here in Atlanta. And the important part of the this has helped, as Kaz said, really improve the lives of many people. Um, my first exposure to Neil, we had baseball World Series last week, and in 95, I was working sideline uh, the Georgia Florida game was in Athens and because they were redoing the stadium down there. So I was working sidelines for CBS and uh, doing sound. I get home to my little uh, 
machine and graves won that night. Though, seriously, those things can you be at uh, Bull Cap Stadium and take out cable, or I think it was ESPN. But that's where I first knew. And we got a sign together, and I had my little pickup truck, and we're going on gobs and gobs of cable and putting it up. But in the talking, he passes his little card to me, and it says that he was a Yale graduate in theater. And at this time, Athens was getting ready to have a building a civic center and a theater. And the powers of be in Athens would not have uh, a local person in charge with no one that. So I said, hey, man, you ought to really come up here and check it out. And so it happened. Several years passed by. Even if she didn't want to be seen, if she I'd been doing freelance work with no big work. And we're at a party out in the woods in Madison County. And I get a call from Will Jackson. And he and Neil are at the International in um, Hawaii. And Microsoft was having an event at Six Flags, and there were short people. And could I bring some people? I'm like, sure. Well, the week before, I had worked out of Six Flags in the spotlight. So for the day, it was a $250 day. After this weekend of two days it's, uh, for the Microsoft and Six Flags, the same word, it was almost an $800 day. Boy, that's kind of Well, Athens, Neil made it to Athens, and with Will and Peter and John Cresta and several others, recreated what had been an old uh, movie projection machine. bringing it in so that that theater stayed as a union house from the beginning. And when folks say that he does not tolerate wrongness in the room, there is still a director in Athens who just shivers at the name of <laughs> 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 Richly deserved also. But all I can say is that what brought me back up to end of 927. Neil is a beautiful family man, a beautiful friend and musician. Neil understood institutional power. Neil understood how this world is put together. And he made it his choice to try and improve the lives of the majority of the people of the bottom. And for that, I will always be grateful that I miss my friend. But we got to go and do the same sort of thing to Eric, girl, Wendy. I wish you all happiness and love. I don't know how you can go. The rest of us, let's do the best we can and just have fun. And so, in the meantime, there's a band to play. It looks like there's a few more stories before we bring the band out. My name's Alicia, and I had the privilege of serving with Wendy and Neil in the Seed and Feed Marching of Honorable Endowment. So there is a third organization represented here, and in the endowment, I got to experience the combination of band Neil and work Neil. And um, I don't normally get to do that. So in the endowment, we served um, three years together. And when we first joined, um, I, we noticed, I, I noticed a very, uh, what I would say, power imbalance in that the seed and feed council appoints the endowment board. But at any time, the council can wipe out all nine endowment board members and start afresh. And we said, we, we need to keep some people here. So it, it takes a lot of reading of the standard operating procedures, a lot of paperwork over here. It takes a lot of reading and editing of the endowment bylaws. And we have to make sure these two documents actually agree with each other in terms of how do we 
now take 20 years of, of this, of nine people being able to be wiped out, replaced, and we just, you know, Neil, throughout that process, what I heard today was, was him always saying, I'll do it. He was the first to volunteer to say, I'll make these two documents a lot better. I'll take it through the rigorous process. I'll do the first edits. And that just, I keep hearing tonight that that exemplifies Neil. And then the, the fixing of this means that now every year we have three board members roll off, three new ones roll on, so that we have continuity in the leadership of that organization. And I, I, I would like to say like that is a legacy that Neil and Wendy at that time leave behind. And, and what I can also hear is that when Neil knows he's right, he's gonna go to bat for it, right? And so you can imagine just the arguments of these nine people in this room trying to make these two documents better and stronger. And, and, and his force behind that was all about making it better for everybody, right? The whole point of it was to leave it in a better state than you bought it and just Neil's fighting for every little word choice that he thought was important um, could, can be a little intimidating sometimes when you're on the other side of that, but I knew that that, that was for a reason and a purpose and both organizations are better for it. And that's just my small little Neil story. Alright, the shock ones are waiting for the last. We do have Shirley that wants to say something, so Shirley, I don't know if you're going to help me, but I'm going to try to get down to Shirley without getting any feedback. So it's an experiment, and we'll try it, and we'll see what happens. My hand on the fader. I'm Shirley. I've been in the CDP band a long, long time. A couple of Time we remember to say happy anniversary to Neil and, and Wendy. It's for Leto. On Sundays we go to the beach, so we them after we perform at the customs house. And when you get there, you have to set up your little place, you know, you have the cooler and the music, the blankets and the chairs, a few flags, maybe put together a kite. Everybody's busy until you get all settled in. We're doing this, and Neil stands up. The little baby Emily. I don't know how old you were, Emily. I don't know if you could even take your first steps for around that age. He would hold you up, and you would hold on to his fingers, and your little fist would hold on to his fingers, and he would pretend walk, I think. It's kind of the way to put it. But he stands up, and he has Emily in his arms, and he says, makes an announcement, he says, I'm taking Emily, and I'm gonna, Show her the ocean for the first time. If anybody wants to come along. So he strides down to the beach, I mean up across the beach to the water, and there's a semicircle of all these adults <laughs> right behind him and Emily, watching him show his baby girl the ocean for the first time. But he wanted to share that moment. And we all loved it. And I'll never forget it. I'll never forget the ocean. All right, we have one final speaker, unless somebody else is no longer shy. All right, one final speaker, Neil. Thank you, thank you. I know you all wanted to see uh, Hawaii, but this is Neil dressed up. Why are you all laughing? So I guess you all haven't seen Neil dressed up. Well, I have. Uh, I am Dewey McClain. Uh, I was, you know, it would make me see a picture or two. Neil and I were sworn in together at the Labor Council together when I was, became president. But make a long story short, I know some labor leaders in here from, I know I've seen uh, Charlie Flippin, who's the president of Georgia NFLC, I've seen Ron Brooks, Sandra James. I mean, you all have to understand, we all love Neil. I mean, Neil, will, did, did y'all love Neil? Yeah. I hope y'all love Neil, because, because I really love Neil. I mean, I saw all these Hawaiian shirts, why did I not get the memo? <laughs> I did not get the memo uh, because uh, 
Neil, uh, my first meeting with Neil, he came in with his Hawaiian shirt on and them shorts, <laughs> and he was barefoot. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, is that, is, is that how you go to an executive union meeting? <laughs> with a Hawaiian shirt on and barefoot. I only say that because uh, I'm also the state representative of House District 100. And I, oh, boo, hey. <laughs> Now, this is the funny point. That's the reason I'm dressed like that because I am down at the county. But about three years ago, and this is my story, it was about three years ago, maybe four years ago, we were at Eagle Rock. And so they were trying to do something out at the, uh, out the studio. And so it was about 20 legislators. And, you know, and, and the people, and, and so, you know, I was talking to the other legislator, and I was doing everything, and I was just talking, and then all of a sudden, I mean, you know how you see somebody, you, but you don't, you think you know them, but you don't know them, but you do know them. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay, anyway, all of a sudden, you know, I was talking over here, and somebody came beside me and said, do it, it's me. Do it, it's me. <laughs> Do it, it's me. I look, and it was me. <laughs> Neil had on the suit. He had on, the, on, on, on shoes. <laughs> he had a tie. <laughs> and I swear, I, and I, I had never seen him that way. But that was the first day. And so I said, Neil, I have seen you with no shoes. <laughs> <laughs> the lowest, and I've seen you in a suit and tie. So I just want you all to know that you all have someone that can represent you from the smallest to the tallest. Right. Because Neil was that way. Thank you all. All right, one more time, I just want to say thank you to everybody who traveled in, everyone who made it out tonight. The fabulous box for allowing us to use this venue that Neil cherished so much. And one last time, let's welcome the Seed and Feed Marching Abominable.